Hello, this is Bad Vibes. Today's video is on late night stories. Basically, any creepy or scary thing that happened late at night. Stories range from sneaking out at night, hitchhiking, leaving a bar, or going on a late night drive. As always for a longer video, all the ads are in the first portion of the video. That way you can get all the interruptions out of the way and then sit back and relax. Also, if you enjoy the video, please hit that like button as it really helps the videos out. So near where I live, but far out in the sticks, there's a glorified gravel path in the woods called Roop Hill. It runs maybe three miles long and only half a mile of it is paved. On the south end is a pavement but with a few old but otherwise normal houses dotting it, deceptively average at that point. Then the houses end, the pavement ends, and the gravel roads shoot up a steep hill. It's not taken care of at all. The gravel is piled up in potholes and berms, so unless you're driving a nice off-road vehicle, you'd want to take it easy. So since you would need to drive slowly, you'd have a nice clear view of the homemade signs nailed to the trees with messages like no trespassing and we're watching you scrawled in sharpie on them. At the top of the hill, the road winds lazily for a little under a mile before driving back down the other side of the hill. The gravel is an equally crappy condition on that side. After you reach the bottom of the hill, the road cuts straightish for about a mile through cornfields before intersecting with another road. The reason why I'm so familiar with this layout is that I've often taken friends on late night drives to this road to scare the crap out of them. Never an elaborate prank. I just drive slowly and play this creepy music to get them amped up and paranoid. I always make sure to talk about the meth heads and their labs out there too and how sheriffs try to avoid going there because it is dangerous. I figured it was bullshit, just stories, but I think now there's an element of truth to some of the rumors. I was with my friend Aaron one night, and we decided to go on a late night drive to Roop Hill to freak ourselves out, so we took off, drove down the various country highways and the back roads, and turned onto it. I made sure to play extra creepy music since me and Aaron had made this trip before. It honestly lost its creepy luster on me by then, but I still enjoyed the long drives and scaring my friends. Of course, it mostly went uneventful, and we were almost across the hill about to descend the other side when Aaron freaked out. I checked my mirrors to see what he was shitting a fit over and saw truck lights down the road. They seemed to be back where the road first topped the hill. The truck made it under the street light on top of the hill, a really dim orange light. I could see that it was kicking up tons of dirt. It was speeding towards us. I paused the music and sure enough, with the windows down, I could hear the gravel crunching and flying like the vehicle was speeding. Keep in mind, I had driven this road dozens of times, both during the day and at night and I had never encountered another vehicle. So having a truck speeding to seemingly catch up to us at midnight on a road with rumored meth heads was pretty jarring. Usually, I didn't relinquish my brakes driving down that hill, but this time, I didn't even touch them. So the next day, I'm hanging out with my other friend, Chris. Chris and I are both lounging around, playing video games, talking about quantum physics, Chris's favorite thing, and Chipotle, my favorite thing. I of course told him about Aaron and I getting chased the previous night and I kinda hammed it up, made it come across a little bit more harrowing than it really was. But now, Chris wanted to go to the road, so we waited until late at night, around two in the morning probably, and went to Roop Hill. This time, I wasn't playing any music, I wanted to be alert. It was going quite normally, just like usual, when I slammed on my brakes. I threw the car in park and just said, Uh, you see that too, right? I looked at Chris and he was just as confused as me and just nodded. My headlights were clearly illuminating a thick metal cable stretched across the road. On the right, it was wrapped around a tree 
at what I guess was roughly a head height for a standing adult. It was pulled taut across the road, anchored to a fence post at roughly chest height. I had no idea what to make of it or how to react when I heard gravel being thrown by tires. I checked my mirrors and sure enough, the truck headlights were tearing us down the road from behind us. I started freaking out. My breathing and heart rate were out of control and I began sweating. Chris just swore under his breath quietly. I threw it in drive, pulled it as far right as I could, and my low seating car slid just under the cable with a loud metal on metal scraping noise. I cringed as I heard it scrape, but I wasn't about to sit there and get deliverance. So again, I flew down the hill, and this is the creepy cherry on the Sunday for me personally, because Chris didn't see it. As we left the tree line and entered the cornfields, I glanced to my right past Chris and briefly caught a glimpse of somebody standing about three or four feet back in the corn. I just felt my stomach scrunch up and I floored the accelerator. I glanced at my rearview mirror and I could see a man standing in the road behind us, illuminated by the moon and my taillights. He had a long object slung over his shoulders. I couldn't tell if it was a cane or maybe a rifle but I didn't want to stay and find out. Before I could even tell Chris about it, we were around the bend and out of sight. I haven't been back to that road since then. Definitely one of my creepiest personal experiences. Update. Finally went back recently and the creepy sign that says, we're watching you with the creepy frowning face is gone. Still some signs that say no jumping, but the threatening atmosphere has passed. Guess I caught the tail end of the meth rain. A few nights ago, this happened to me, and I keep thinking about it. Now, I work in the criminal justice field where I see a lot of crime, and I'm also naturally a follower of the subreddit, scary movies, and scary stories in general so I have to disclaim that I do have a hindsighted sense of paranoia sometimes. But my girlfriend and her roommate both agreed that this was weird. I was out walking my girlfriend's roommate's dog as she was working a night shift in her neighborhood, which is a very safe suburb of New York. I walked across the parking lot into this field in the middle of a roundabout. I was screwing around on Reddit since it was near midnight and in the middle of quarantine so there are no cars out. The dog has a long leash, so she's sniffing around, and then I kind of saw her stop and stare towards the road. I looked up and saw a black SUV stopped at the roundabout. I pulled on my COVID mask that was on my chin, as some people in New York are touchy about it, understandably, just in case they stop to lecture me. I looked back at my phone and then back up at the SUV that was still there. There was a family, mother, father in the front, and a 12 or so year old daughter in the back. I was a bit startled because they were just blankly staring directly at me. I sort of waved and nodded and started walking the dog a bit around the grass again. They started to slowly move. They came around the roundabout and I looked back and all of them were again staring directly at me. I figured they may talk to me, so I stopped and waited for them to get around the circle. But when they approached, they kept driving very slowly, all still staring directly at me. I gave them another half wave and they drove past me, back around the circle, then again around the circle, literally all of them blankly staring at me, even the little girl in the back seat. I put my arms up in like a shrugging gesture, as if to say, what the fuck? They did this a couple more times, so I started walking to the edge of the circle to engage. Normally something I would not do, but it was a family, so I sort of felt a bit more brave to do so. They sped up a bit and went around the corner and turned off the roundabout. I started to feel even weirder, so I decided to walk back to her apartment building when they entered the roundabout again. I was watching them out of the corner of my eye, and they were still staring. I started picking up the pace and they turned off the roundabout towards me and I picked up the pace even more as they followed me. Once I got to the sidewalk, I turned around because I didn't want them to know which door I was walking into. 
They stopped about 30 feet behind me and they were staring from the front window. The little girl was in the center seat now, staring too. I once again raised my arms to be like, can I help you? No response at all from them. I kind of stood there and with no movement, I took out my phone and typed a license plate into the note app. Then they slowly turned to the other side of the parking lot, all still staring. Until they got to the end of the lot, I rushed into the apartment building, which luckily needed a code to enter. I got up there and told my girlfriend and then her roommate later that morning. They were both kind of freaked out. I watched them out her window and they pulled back up to where I was standing on the sidewalk and just sat there in their car. I couldn't see them at this point, only the roof of their car. It felt like 10 minutes and then they slowly drove away. I can't stop thinking about their creepy ass blank stare at me. Somehow it made it creepier that it was a normal looking family with a younger daughter. If it was like two younger guys, I could have marked it off as them being bored and screwing with me, but this was just blank, unmoving expressions that made it feel so eerie. I'm a guy. This was probably 9 or 10 years ago. I was in my mid-30s, out of town with some co-workers at an IT conference for the week. It was a nice town, as these things go. At least, the main street was anyways. One night, one of the companies sponsoring the conference had an open bar night at a club. Of course, I drank too much, and after the rest of my co-workers left to go back to the hotel, I stayed and kept drinking. The bar closed and on my way back someone else from the conference decided to take it out on himself to make sure I got to the hotel safely. I didn't want to and quite frankly I was asked to him about it. We got back to the hotel and I decided what I really needed was a cigarette. So when the guy left I went to a different exit to find a store that was open at 2am to get a pack of smokes. Back then I used to smoke when I was drinking. Not anymore. I walked up and down the main street trying to find a place that was open, but everything was closed. I ran into a couple that I assumed were locals and asked if they knew of any stores that were open at this hour so I could get some smokes. They said, sure, follow us. They started leading me off the main street and after a couple of blocks my drunken brain started to realize we were quickly getting to a more dangerous part of town. So I started asking them how far it was. It's right over here, they kept saying. Then we get to this construction site and I was really scared. It's right down here, they said. I looked to where they were pointing and it was a dark alleyway. I said, okay, I'm right behind you and bolted in the other direction in a full sprint. I rounded a corner, slipped on some gravel and wiped out, tore multiple holes in my jeans. My palms were covered with gravel and bleeding. I hid behind a dumpster for a few minutes, and then I heard them walking back, talking to each other, but I couldn't tell what they were saying. When I couldn't hear them anymore, I ran back to the main street because it was well lit, and my hotel was several blocks down the main street, so that was my lifeline to safety. On my way back, I hear them at the next block or two shouting, Where did that guy go? I started hearing additional voices with them, but I couldn't make out what they were saying but they were unquestionably talking to the original two. I hurried to the hotel and got to my room and quickly passed out, still pretty drunk but sobered a bit from all the adrenaline. I'm quite sure I narrowly avoided getting robbed or worse in that dark alley and they were looking for me for a while after I ran off. That guy who tried to get me safely back to the hotel deserves some props and an apology for me bugging out on him like that afterwards. Unfortunately, I didn't see him for the rest of the conference, but I probably would have been too embarrassed to say anything to him back then. This happened years ago, but I still think of it often and refer to it as my scariest story. I was 20 and just got in my first car, Ford Mustang Convertible. My favorite thing in the world was to drive late at night on abandoned roads. I decided to take my car for a drive. 
and bear with me when I describe the roads to you because it does have bearing, I promise. I live in the Denver metro area in Colorado at the time, and my favorite roads were mountain roads. This time, however, I wanted to stay in range of cell service. I had been talking to my new beau, so I drove down to Golden to follow Highway 93 along the front range up to Broomfield or Boulder. It's usually a pretty good and solitary drive at night, and it was around 1am, so I knew that I'd have the road to myself. All was going well. I had passed the road work and cop at the 72nd St. Juncture and decided to get off the road in Broomfield that would take me east, perpendicular to Highway 93, down a looping, hilly street until I reached Indiana Street. Indiana parallels Highway 93 until it ends against a road further south, closer to where my home was. As I'm turning onto Indiana, I see the first cars I've seen since the cop at 72nd and Highway 93. There was a large diesel pickup in front of me and a red hatchback in front of them, also turning south onto Indiana. The hatchback, however, was going frustratingly slow. Indiana Street is a very hilly road. Speed limits are 50 to 55, and there's only two lanes, north and south. The truck, deciding after a while of tooling behind this hatchback at 25 miles per hour to cross the double yellow line and go around the hatchback, they sped off into the distance, risking the low visibility of the hills, going back over and disappeared out of sight. The hatchback hadn't changed speed, but I decided to hang out behind them because the night was fine. I was in no rush and I was scared of crossing the double yellow lines. Death Proof is my favorite car movie, but the images of the head-on collisions never go away from me. I was confused at this point about the motives of the hatchback driver but it didn't seem too horrible to stay a car length behind them and wait, going 25 miles per hour up the hill still. I checked my phone, only to find it was dead, and as I recently bought this car, I didn't have a charger with me for the cigarette port. This made me even more uneasy when the hatchback slammed on their brakes and came to a complete stop. I couldn't see an animal or anything that warranted it. I was freaked out enough to overcome my fears I crossed the double yellow line and sped past them, but they sped up too. Thinking it was a mistake, I sped up more, reaching the actual speed limit of 50 to 55. They matched me, and I was swiveling my head, trying to see the other driver's side window and looking out for incoming headlights at each hilltop. I sped up even more, this time reaching 65, and still nothing gives. They're matching my speed and keeping me from getting over in front of them. I slowed down, backing off, but they slowed down too. Finally, scared out of my mind, I punched the gas, bringing me up to 80 and slipped back over the double yellow. They tried to match my speed, but I had been significantly ahead of them for long enough to get over. Although I was scared of scraping my bumpers, they were so close. I didn't know what I expected, but when they started bumping the back of my car with theirs, I was in full freak mode. I knew that 72nd was coming up, that if I took a ride on it, I could get back on Highway 93 and the safety of the cop, so I turned my blinker on far before the juncture to let this crazy person know that I intended to get back out of their way for good. They didn't back off. If I slowed down, the pressure against my back bumper merely increased. They were still barreling along at a white knuckle speed of 65 to 70, and we passed 72nd without me being able to turn off on Indiana. The next road coming up was Leyden Gulch Road, and to my surprise, they started backing off. I flicked my blinker on without thinking, wanting to get away from them ASAP, but of course they followed me onto the road, continuing to press out of my back bumper until we were going 60 in a 45 with no real street lamps and a lot of curves. I couldn't remember if this road went all the way to 93, but I was praying it did when I started seeing some cones and signs of road work along the side of the road. Suddenly I saw a road close sign moved off to the left of the road. It had been in the middle earlier that day, and instinctively I slowed down, thinking about cartoon characters flying off the edge of a cliff where a bridge used to be. Luckily the hatchback slowed down too. We slowed down to a reasonable 35 and I thought that the danger was over when the road ahead turned into gravel. 
and suddenly I was driving past mounds of dirt and gravel several times bigger than my car. I tried to make a U-turn, but the piles were too close together and I ended up horizontal, trapped between three piles to either side and behind me. Ever since I had gotten in front of it, they've had their brights on and I couldn't make out the face or license plate. Now, as I drove up the middle of the road perpendicular to me, I was blinded and panicked. I tried to think of what would make them, whoever they were, hesitate to think twice. I settled for looking cocky and almost smirking. I'm a girl, so seeing a girl who should be hella freaked out, looking amused and self-assured would be weird in this situation. I imagined I had a gun or some kind of secret up my sleeve that they wouldn't want to mess with. There was a really long silence during which I started to wonder if they had a gun or what was going on. Finally, I heard a door quietly shut. The silence, lack of yelling, road rage, and explanations freaked me out that I decided to risk driving my car directly to one of those piles, hoping to go slanted up across the side of the pile around the car. I kept my face locked into a, the fuck you doing here, sort of face, hit the gas, looking at where I presumed they were the whole time. I was still pretty blinded and couldn't see much, but bright light or shadows. My car miraculously made it and I tore it out of the dead end roadwork zone and back onto Indiana Street. I looked for pursuit, but didn't see anyone and made it home safely without seeing many other cars that night. The next day I went back to the area with my brother and sister and the road close sign was back across the middle of the road, no longer at its side. I tried to call the police, but it was problematic because I didn't have a lot of useful info beyond they drove a red hatchback, and also there was a little girl, 10, missing at the time, Jessica Ridgeway, and all the resources were on the manhunt. They eventually found her body and Linda Glutch, but the teen accused did not own a red hatchback, so I'm at a loss. So this happened in 2012 when I was 15, about to turn 16. I used to sneak out a lot as a teenager and meet up with my friends who lived in the neighborhood nearby, maybe a 15 to 20 minute walk at best. We did this multiple times a week, just bullshitting around. Well, there was this one night I was walking through my neighborhood, which is pretty nice, upper middle class I would guess now, but I remember hearing crying in the distance of what sounded like a baby crying which honestly startled me. I was thinking about how odd it was to hear in the dead of night, outside, and that loud, but being as freaked out as I was, I remember hiding in a nearby bush next to someone's house and waiting, listening as I heard the sound get closer. I remember looking down the road and seeing a big white van driving slowly down the road without any lights on. I was watching them come to multiple stops as they made their way down the road, before parking on the street and turning the sound off. They just sat there for about five minutes before I finally got the nerve to jolt, running all the way home and getting caught by my parents. I always found it weird as shit as to why anyone would mimic the sound of a crying baby in the middle of the night like that. This happened to me last night after a night of a lot of drinks. Names are generic because fuck it, why not? I'm a 30 year old male. My friend John is 30 and our friend Jane is 28. We're drinking at our local friend's bar. It's a small place and not particularly popular. So our friend behind the bar was quick to refill our drinks as we finished them. After last call, we decided to get food for our drunk munchies. There obviously weren't too many options but we ended up going to a breakfast cafe in the bad part of town. While we were there, everything was fine. We paid and started walking out. On our way out the door, there was this shady looking guy, only wearing an open hoodie, no shirt under, and baggy worn out jeans. He was leaning in the hallway for the bathrooms by the exit and watched us leave. As we were walking to the side of the building where our lift driver was picking us up, we noticed the sketchy looking fellow following about 10 to 15 feet behind us. We pick up our pace and got to the car and locked the door before greeting the driver, quickly said our name so that he knew that we were the riders, 
and asked him to pull away because we had a bad feeling. As we pulled out a lot, I turned to watch his sketch ball. I noticed that he had put a mask on and was wearing a single glove on his right hand and I think he might have had a gun or knife. The creep stood behind a bush watching us leave. We called the restaurant to report it. Probably should have phoned the police too, but didn't really know if we were just overreacting. Edit. I called to file a police report earlier today per some comments here. They took notes and my info and said that they would reach out if they needed more information. I was leaving the bar tonight around 12.30 a.m. going to the parking lot they share with a few other businesses. I felt I should grab my pepper spray and keys from my purse for some reason. But it wasn't too far from where my friends were standing and I didn't need my keys to open my car. This might be where it all started. I walked the 15 yards to my car. Again, don't need the keys to my car to open my door as long as they are on my person. I open the door and look inside, like I've done a million times in this parking lot, and sitting there is a man I immediately did not recognize. Immediately, I freeze and ask, Hello? Who the, who the hell are you? Meanwhile, I take in that he's sitting on my passenger seat, going through my glove box, holding my registration. He says, Are you? And says a name similar to mine. I try to think how I can get out of there fast because my mind goes to the idea that he could pull a weapon out at any point. I say, no, but I'll go get her. And I turn around to run back to the bar to tell my friends and the bartender. They check it out 30 seconds later and the guy took off before anyone could see him. I'm female and at the time I was 16. I was hanging out at my friend's place, Ava, 16, with another girl, Abigail, 14. We decided it would be a great idea to sneak out of the apartment in the middle of the night. For some background, it was a suburban Eastern European neighborhood, so the idea wasn't that bright as you have probably figured. Cut to the chase, at around 1.15am, we first decided to go out. The plan was to keep walking in a straight line until we got to the town's river. Pretty easy, right? As we were walking, to my horror, I see in front of us a tall, middle-aged man shouting a boy's name, which was Andrew, as he was holding a pocket knife. I knew straight off that it was bad news. Terrified, I whispered to my friend very closely, We need to back off. Can't explain now. Just go backwards, slowly. With Ava almost being legally blind, she couldn't see much in the dark and definitely did not see the man, so she starts running backwards like crazy. She steps on a branch and makes the loudest freaking sound one could ever make in this situation. The middle-aged man turns around, looks me straight in the eyes, so I say fuck it and start running too. We get back to the apartment safe and sound. A couple drinks later, my other friend Abigail decides she wants to sneak out too. And me being the rebellious teen I was, I followed her out without a second thought. At this time, it was about 3 a.m. We were hanging out in the park smoking and talking about boys when suddenly, lo and behold, at that park entrance, the middle-aged man. I tell her, okay, this is not good. We need to go back now. So we quietly leave the park and, thank God, he didn't start chasing us. Worse, he got into a white van. It was obvious that the van was following us from a distance, but that wasn't the problem, as we were close to Ava's house, right? So I thought until Abigail turns to me and whispers, don't let it show, but I think we're lost. And then it hits me, we lost our direction. We start turning down random corners, desperately looking for the place, until we run into Ava's dad, who had woken up to the horror of two missing kids. I think it was obvious that we all got a pretty bad lecture and then were sent off to sleep. Looking back on it, as much as I hated her dad for that, I could say that someone was probably looking out for us up there. I can't stress it enough, don't play with your chances like this. There's a lot of sick people out there, especially in sketchy neighborhoods in the middle of the night. To this day, I wonder what could have happened if we hadn't found the house in time. Stay safe, y'all.
I live in a neighborhood next to a busy intersection and my neighborhood is guarded by a nice tree line that unfortunately removes all the privacy in the fall and winter from the constant traffic. Every other night for the past two months, I go out to smoke around 7 to 9 p.m. I'm standing there and smoking a cigarette on my front porch. This small car pulls to the side of the road in the pitch dark and watches me smoke under the porch and doesn't leave until I go inside. This has happened three times already, but I think last night my heart sunk to my testicles because I realized it's the same car, same spot. This time I stared back in the fucking dark under the very dim light and they drove off. What the fuck? How did they see me so clearly? I'm not sure why this car is fixated on me when I go outside to smoke under the dim porch light, but it's starting to bother me. Around 2015, I was in high school and worked a very late night shift in the city on the weekends. One night, the subway I was on got delayed and after 30 minutes of sitting in the cars, the conductor told everyone to leave because the trains weren't going to run for that night. Everyone on the train either called a cab or walked a 30 minute walk to the bridge in one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in New York City. I was 16 and alone and extremely exhausted after working on my feet for 10 hours. I tried to call a cab and they said it would take up to 20 minutes to come and get me but by the time it comes, I could have already arrived at my destination. So I decided to walk the bridge and I felt somewhat safe because other people were walking a few feet ahead of me. There were people from the train as well. At first I didn't know which direction to walk in as it was dark and there are no signs. I start walking in the opposite direction and this middle aged man who spoke in broken English calls for me and motions me to the right direction. I immediately thank him and he walks with me from that point. He begins asking me questions like, why are you walking around so late? Do you live with anyone at home? How old are you? I'm hesitant to answer these questions and at this point I'm super creeped out. Luckily this girl around my age was walking behind me and the guy and stopped us so she could ask if I knew the guy. I said that I didn't and the guy immediately took my arm and refused to let me go. She was with her boyfriend and her boyfriend threatened to fight him if he didn't leave me alone. After the boyfriend threatened him, the guy ran off immediately without hesitation. The couple walked with me until we finally got off the bridge and I arrived in a safe neighborhood. From there, I thanked them so many times and told her that I was grateful for her. I still think about this encounter to this day and I honestly don't know what would have happened if that girl hadn't been there to save me. I'm so grateful that she did. My family lives at the top of a hill from a high crime area on the outskirts of the city. People who live at the bottom of the hill often come up to our little neighborhood to use the courts and the church and the middle school. Sometimes we see them wandering back down the hill after dark and sometimes kids cut through our yard to avoid having to walk down the sharp curve that cars sometimes take too fast. We've had accidents and near misses outside, so I don't mind if kids cut through our well-lit yard as long as they keep moving and don't mess with anything. I kept the lights on until it's time for bed and then I switch over to motion sensors. Recent events led me to install cameras and signs indicating that the property is monitored. Around 3 last night, I was home alone and drifting out to sleep when the security camera behind the house pinged. It detected movement. Usually it's a groundhog or some small rodent. I brought up the camera on my cell phone. The enhanced vision displayed a shape in the bottom of the right corner, leaning or pressing against the side of the house, rocking back and forth. I can also make out steam rising from him, which was a telltale sign of taking up standing piss against my foundation. I could have activated the speaker and scared him off, but I wanted to go back to sleep so I watched on making sure he kept moving along. He didn't. He kept close to the wall as he moved along, suggesting he knew that there was a light sensor covering the center of the yard. He stopped at the dining room window, pulled out a small light, and cased the room with it. That was when I chose to turn on the speaker and address him directly. I pressed the microphone icon on the phone and said, You are being watched. It was loud enough to fill the side of the yard. 
It didn't seem to bother him, and if the speaker wasn't mounted right outside the bedroom window, I might have thought I muted it. I added, You are being recorded, guy with a flashlight looking into my house. He turned towards the camera, still hiding his face under his hood and said, This right here is your weak spot. He waved the light into my dining room window again to illustrate. I'ma prove it to you someday if you don't get it fixed. After that, he flashes the light on the camera, blinding it until he hopped the garden fence at the edge of the yard and vanished. I shared the video with the police who found it amusing, at least the excuse. I got a sense that one of them seemed to recognize his voice. However, they gave me no promises or assurances. Looking at the yard, I tried to figure out why the dining room might be the weak spot. I think I'll take the morning to figure it out. My ex and I lived in a brand new subdivision. It was two houses and an unfinished house with vacant lots. One area was far from the house and nearly in the woods. Late one night, maybe two or so in the morning, the doorbell rings and rings and rings. Finally getting annoyed and worrying about a newborn waking up, my ex and I answer the door. There's a couple, a man and a woman standing there. They said that they broke down and needed some help. They are all the way in the back lot. My ex is not the smartest guy, but he's an auto mechanic, so he decides to go help them. I tell him it seems weird. He doesn't listen, so I do the next best thing and tell him that I'll drive over, leaving the baby in the house. I wait in the truck while he checks it out. They keep insisting he go under the car, under the dashboard, all sorts of weird stuff that would make him prone and easily attacked. My ex keeps telling him that he can't because he's huge. He's nearly seven foot tall, 350 pounds, he simply doesn't fit, so he comes back to me and says that now it seems weird, he's finding nothing wrong. He gets in the truck and we call 911 and tell him that we're calling a wrecker. We see the two people running off into the woods, so we lock ourselves in the house until the cops show up. The cops check out the scene, find the two people not hiding very well due to the serious amounts of drugs that they're on, and realize the car is stolen. I'm positive they would have branded my ex, giving them a chance to rob the house. So 2am drug heads, please stay in prison, let's never meet again. Back in 2015 when I was in my second semester of college, as a freshman, I had a habit of pacing around to keep my thoughts coming. I had this habit since childhood and it often seemed that I couldn't stay focused on anything that required creative thought without it. Considering my intended major required literature and creative writing courses, it was something that I found myself doing constantly, especially when I was trying to think up ideas for essays and narrative assignments in class. To be clear, my pacing isn't just walking. It needs to be done along a predictable, short route so I can mentally clock out of reality and focus solely on my thoughts while I run on autopilot. I often put in my headphones to prevent distractions that take me back into reality because if it happens mid-thought pattern, I'll lose at least half of the ideas that I was exploring. Weird, I know, but I want to clarify this now. Because I've had a lot of people ask me why I don't just go for a long walk around the neighborhood instead of me walking around in circles in the backyard like I normally do. It was getting late one evening and I had a lengthy essay due the day after next. I had a good portion of it already done, but I still had a bit to go. My roommate had come back into the dorm and considering the time, it was perfectly understandable that she wanted to sleep. She generally didn't mind my pacing, but I preferred that I didn't do it when she was trying to rest, also understandable, and with her turning off the lights in the room, it would be a little difficult for me anyway. I still wanted to keep going on this assignment though, so I decided to find somewhere else on campus outside the room to pace in, and figured I'd note down ideas in an app on my phone as needed for later. 
There was no one in the dorm complex that was suitable, so I started walking around. The university was well known for the large campus, so I figured I'd find a good place eventually. I walked for a bit until I found myself at one of the more historic buildings, which had a nice courtyard in front of it. Part of the courtyard included wide pedestrian paths that met at the center at a nice roundabout with a fountain in the middle. A little further from it was another small roundabout with a grass island in the center. Circular paths like that are ideal for my pacing because I don't have to stop and turn around repeatedly and I ended up choosing to walk around the one with the grass island so I wouldn't disturb anyone that wanted to hang out by the fountain. Some people are a bit unnerved by my pacing, so I worried it might freak out a stranger who saw me on a late night walk. There was an occasional passerby, but for the most part this place was empty at this time of night. I figured I could just go in circles for a bit without disturbing anyone. I put in my headphones, yes, both of them, and yes, I'm aware it was a poor decision given the circumstances. But I was exhausted and just wanted to get this brainstorming session over with so I could go to sleep. I started to walk in circles with my music playing as my mind drifted. I don't know how long I was pacing before the encounter, but it wasn't long. As I was rounding once more, I was met by a headlight from a car driving slowly up the path to the roundabout. I was a little confused by this as I was sure that this path was meant for pedestrian traffic only. But since it was deserted, save for me, I assumed that the driver just needed an easy way to turn around and didn't think it was a big deal since the risk of accidentally hitting someone was next to zero. The vehicle moved past me while I moved closer to the center to keep from being in its way and kept my eyes on it while I walked. I expected the car to just go around and then back down the path where it came from since that was the only path on the roundabout that led back to the street but instead, it came to a stop on the side of the roundabout opposite the street. While initially, I started to assume then that they needed to look at their GPS or make a phone call before continuing. There was no denying the uneasy feeling I got about the situation. Instead of continuing my route, which would have taken me right alongside the vehicle, I decided to take one of the paths towards the building and just wait for them to move on. While I walked, I noticed an empty parking lot on the side of the building. The path didn't go there, but it was easy to walk over the grass patch dividing the two areas. I started to pace in the lot for a bit and quickly forgot about returning to the roundabout as I got lost in my thoughts again. I was pulled back into reality by the shine of the semi-distant headlights. It was the same car as before, or at least looked eerily similar. Luckily, I was facing the entrance to the lot as it turned in, and said entrance was a decent distance from me. I started to hear quiet alarm bells in the back of my mind, even though the rational side tried to assume that it must have been a different car and an odd coincidence, and perhaps I was just paranoid. Regardless of my mental attempts to explain it away, I felt it was better to be safe than sorry. I ended up walking around the other side of the building to get back to the little roundabout I was at before. I took a breath and calmed my nerves a little, with some half-hearted reassurance before walking on the roundabout again. This time, I didn't turn my music back on, but I kept my headphones in. They weren't noise cancelling at all, so I could hear decently through them when the music was paused. I wanted to go back to brainstorming, but I felt somewhat anxious and panicky at the thought of it. So I kept pacing like I had been, this time focused and very much more aware of what was going on around me. I thought that maybe once 10 or 15 minutes had gone by without incident, I'd be able to calm down and get the last of this done. Barely 5 minutes passed when I heard the obvious sound of rubber tires coming up the path again. This time when I looked, I was certain that it was the same car and that it had followed me back from the parking lot. I didn't know what the driver wanted. They never honked, rolled down their windows, or anything to try to get my attention. But I realized at this point that as a 19 year old girl alone at night in a more secluded area of the campus, I've been extremely lucky so far and that luck wouldn't last forever. This time I sped walk through the grass, 
There's a pedestrian only arch bridge that goes over a busy major street that runs through campus. Most of the dorms like mine are on one side of the bridge while lecture halls and class buildings are on the other. And while I normally hated the bridge because of how steep it was, it was closer than the nearest street crossing right then and didn't have a wait time to cross it. Also, there's no chance of a vehicle following me up. I felt much more at ease from the top of it and from there I saw the car drive off, seemingly calling it a night. I walked back to my dorm and by the time I reached my door, the adrenaline had worn off and I was just exhausted. I went in quietly not to wake up my roommate, laid back into bed without changing into my pajamas and fell asleep. I never contacted campus police about the matter or anything because I didn't have any helpful information other than four door car that could have been black or dark blue for all I know and it didn't seem like I'd be believed anyway. I never saw that vehicle again or heard anything that was related to it in any way. So over time, it slipped my mind altogether. I still don't know what that driver planned or why they didn't just get out of the car and come after me on foot at that point. Maybe it was the first time they were trying this and they were nervous about making a scene and getting caught. Maybe it was just some college age assholes messing with me because they thought it was fun to scare people like that. Whatever it was, I'm glad I didn't have to find out the hard way and I never paced in public areas after dark on that campus ever again. This happened in summer. I was 17 and lived with my parents in a little village in the south of France. I was hanging out with my friend at a local McDonald's gas station next to the motorway, bumming cigarettes off people. It was around 7 or 8. We were both bored out of our minds and keen to get some weed but had no one selling in our area. The only way was to go to a town nearby which was 20 minutes drive and a good two and a half hours walking. We decided to walk, hitchhike there and after something like 20 minutes of walking, someone picks us up and drops us off about a one hour walk away from the spot we were heading for. Casual guy, nothing unusual. We walk the rest of the way, get our weed, find a place to hang out and light up. After a while we start walking back, both pretty fucked up. And after another hour walk, we're by a main road hitchhiking again. It's pretty late now, around 1am and not many cars drive by. After a while, a car that had already driven by 10 minutes before stops. Guy rolls down his window and says that he recognized us from driving past the first time and felt bad that no one picked us up. We tell him where we're headed and he agrees to drop us off even though it's not on his way. Happy that we don't have to walk for the next couple hours, we get in, me in the front seat and my friend in the back seat and the guy starts driving. I'm quite stoned at this point so it takes me a while to notice that he's driving in the middle of the road between lanes. I realize that he's probably drunk or on something as he zigzags and occasionally drives on the sidewalk. Luckily, there's no one else on the road. This guy also talks in a weird way, mumbling and mixing up words. After a bit of small talk, he asks us if we have any drugs, weed or such. Trying our best not to look stoned, I tell him we don't smoke or anything. But he insists, telling us he needs to know so we can hide in the glove compartment in case he gets pulled over. I tell him it's the truth. He then tells us that he needs to drop by and tell his family he's going to take us home, that it won't be long. He seems pretty keen on introducing us to them. He takes a turn, and that's us, off to an unknown place in a complete stranger's car in the middle of the night, no one knowing we left or where we went. I start panicking a bit and ask the guy if he could take us straight home. He tells us not to worry and it won't take long. After a moment of silence, he says, You're scared, aren't you? I'm not up to anything. Don't you worry. I try not to sound worried, laugh and say, No, I trust him and it's cool. I start checking if the doors are locked or if he has anything to use as a weapon or something. And I think if the doors are locked, the only way we can get out is by beating the shit out of this guy. 
Where the fuck is he taking us? What does he want? We don't talk until we reach the supposed destination. A small and dark alley, a couple of minutes away from the main road. He parks next to some houses, tells us to get out, and unlocks the doors. I take a deep breath and step out. I see a woman carrying a child, staring out over the garden wall of one of the houses. The guy yells, Look honey, I'm with my friends here. Guys, say hi to my family. I think she saw that he was drunk or something, stared at us suspiciously, and walked back into the house without a word. We get back into the car and he starts driving again. That's my wife, he mumbles in a drunken way. A few minutes later, we enter the village and he asks us where we live. I tell him it's fine that he can drop us off right here, but he insists. I want to know where my buddies live. I lie to him and tell him just down the road. We thank him and get out and head home. I often hitchhiked, never that late though, and it always went well. Nothing happened, but it made me realize getting into random people's cars is maybe not the best idea. Also, we could have easily crashed or hurt someone. I've never hitchhiked since. I've told this story to nearly anyone that I've been somewhat close to, but I've never shared it anywhere online. It isn't as bad as most of the other stories I see here, but my mom definitely didn't take it lightly. Considering how much I cried and how long I've been refusing to leave my house after it happened, it took place in late May 2018 on my way back home from my old best friend's birthday party. I was 13 at the time, if that matters, or changes anything. Her house is about 7-10 to 10 minutes away from mine if you're using a bike, and basically next to a huge field at the end of the place. It takes me an even smaller amount of time to reach, considering how fast I always rode, which is a really relevant part of the whole event. I had a lot of fun that day and stayed after the majority of the other friends left, which was a huge mistake. It was getting dark so I decided to go back to my house, but I stayed playing outside with the neighbors until she called me, saying that my mom was demanding I go home. I felt really upset about it, but didn't want to make my mother mad or annoy my best friend at the time, so I just unenthusiastically complied. Before I left, we took some pictures and she gave me a flashlight since I forgot to bring the bike light. Now, this is where things gradually start going downhill. We're at her gate. She's handing me the flashlight. We're saying our goodbyes and the only thing I have on my mind is not getting caught by the cops for having an improper light. That thought was extremely irrational. The moment she closed the gate and went back inside, I got a really sharp feeling in my stomach. A mix of adrenaline rush and getting stabbed except it doesn't actually hurt. I'm bad at describing things and even worse at distinguishing what they are, but I guess it was quite literally a gut feeling. If not that, it was some sort of a sign at least. I'm a really skeptical person and rarely ever experience such things, and when I do, I struggle with determining if it's just me being paranoid or a real hunch. This was the most vivid thing ever though. Back to the thing. I rode for maybe about 30 seconds to a minute when I got an urge to stop before a short concrete bridge that's part of the road. I got a really big urge to go back and ask my old best friend to go with me or at least call my uncle to pick me up, which I knew would be too big of a hassle since I had my bike with me. The road I was on at the moment was on the right side of a really long one, which basically leads straight to the street where my house is, so I just kept going and ignored it. This is where the whole event takes place. I think somewhere around 10pm if my memory serves me right, and this place is pretty small, 6k people, so I didn't expect anyone to be on the streets except the cops, and my stupid self thought they would appear out of nowhere. Well, now I really wish there were cops patrolling around that night. I rode over the bridge, streets fully empty, till I saw a group of guys emerge from the road on the right side, a bit further away from me, walking in the same direction, so I don't think they saw me. At that point, I slowed down and was contemplating what to do. I wanted to take another route, but I thought I would get lost and run into them, 
So I was about to hide behind the trees and bushes, wait for them to go away and continue my way back. I just kept going though. I started riding at my normal speed, but increased it when I saw them a few meters away. As I passed by them, one of them yelled out something along the lines of, Hey bitch! I saw two of them speeding up their walk and nearly running while attempting to get in front of me. Then one of them threw a really thick branch, or I don't even know what it was, at my wheel. I was already shaken up at this point, but just kept going and thought that they were drunk and messing around till I heard them running. My blood literally froze and I was filled with dread, something I don't recall experiencing before that. Thoughts were racing through my head, knowing that there would be no one to help me if something happened since the streets were dead, and then one of them yelling something along the lines of, it's not worth it. The running stopped and as terrified as I was, I also got relief knowing that they gave up on whatever they were trying to pull. It didn't prevent the remaining one or two minutes from feeling like a race with death though. It all happened so quickly, but felt like an eternity. I literally bumped into the gate of my house, locked it, threw my bike on the ground and sprinted aside, locking the entrance to my house. My grandma greeted me and asked me why I was in such a rush since she had been watching me from the window and I just started sobbing and telling her about what just happened in a really messy order with a lot of missing parts. I'm not sure if she even understood what exactly happened. She did tell me that she saw no guys leaving the street, which means they went back instead of continuing their way. I don't know if they were just drunk and trying to scare me, but I don't want to think of what would have happened if the branch actually got my wheel and made me fall over my bike. But maybe they would have turned back away anyway, so if I had hidden, I would have been in a worse position. I have no clue at this point, but I know it's had a huge impact on my already anxious self and my life during the next six months. I quit going to dance classes because they would usually start at 9pm and end at 11. I stopped leaving the house except for school, and any time I walked back alone, I was straight up sprinting to my house regardless of it being 1 p.m. or 7 p.m. I don't remember the last time I left my house at night without being in a car. 